Again? What is happening there? Starship stacked and then de-stacked again. Did something break? Potential new launch date reveal. Starliner delayed yet again and the International Space Station is less and less safe. My name is Felix, welcome to What About It, let's dive right in. Right now, Starbase feels like they are stuck in a time loop. The hot staging ring was installed on top of Booster 9 yet again. And as if they were rehearsing a few hours later, Ship 25 made its way onto the orbital stack for the third time. On October 16th, the anticipation buzzed as everyone was hoping to see a wet dress rehearsal. But 24 hours later, we encountered a surprising plot twist. Unexpectedly, Mechazilla, SpaceX's giant rocket launch tower, returned Ship 25 to its transport stand. So what happened? Why stack and de-stack over and over again? While the exact issue remains shrouded in mystery, we have some clues. The Starbase team in an unusual move did not connect the arm to the ship quick disconnect panel. This panel is used to power the Starship's upper stage as well as deliver fuel from the orbital tank farm. Ports on it were later covered, confirming that the original plan indeed was to hook it up to the tower. We have two theories. First of all, Booster 9's forward dome has been in the spotlight lately. If by the time you're viewing this, the hot staging ring has been removed, it might hint at some fitment issues with the ring itself. On the other hand, some of you, our eagle-eyed viewers, might have noticed an increasing difficulty in aligning the ship QD arm over time. But why is that the case? There is a possibility that with all that mass on top, the ground beneath the orbital launch mount is shifting, moving the location of the quick disconnect plate relative to the arm itself. That's pure speculation on our side, but who knows? What do you think? Is that even possible? Please let me know in the comments. The quick disconnect arm issue could have an easy solution though. What if we added another axis of motion to it? It could then precisely adapt and dock with the ship every single time like a hand fitting into a glove. I am just throwing some ideas out there. I genuinely hope it's nothing too concerning and that a minor tweak or realignment can prep the stack for its second orbital attempt. Okay, but what about our notice to mariners? Did anything happen? Turns out we saw exactly zero testing on the 17th. This likely gives more credit to our previous speculations about it being related to the wet dress rehearsal. No full stack, no testing. There was a scheduled closure for October 19th, but let's face it, by the time you're watching this, that date is in the rearview mirror. We heard some rumors suggesting that some SpaceX action is scheduled for Friday, precisely when you're tuning into this episode of What About It? Alright Felix, I hear you, Starship testing is cool and all, but what about flight number two? Any juicy tidbits on the launch date? Has the US Fish and Wildlife Services finished their thing, whatever that thing is? Well, sit tight, because there is some tea to spill, though perhaps not the flavor you were hoping for. The Federal Aviation Administration told the Washington Post, that website owned by Jeff Bezos, that discussions about the Starbase flame deflector will stretch into November. While we're still hopeful for Starship's second flight this year, dreams of a third one in 2023 are getting a bit hazy. Tim Hughes, SpaceX's senior vice president, paints a picture of irony. Here they are, fixing and upgrading the mammoth launch pad, creating the history's biggest rocket ever in just a few months, and yet the greatest obstacle turns out to be bureaucratic red tape. It seems that the FAA's space division could use a few more hands on deck. Back in 2015, the agency was only overseeing a mere 15 launches. Fast forward to 2027 and the number is predicted to skyrocket to an impressive 288 launches per year. Currently, there is a tug of war at SpaceX. Do they pour more manpower into obtaining Starship licenses or ramp up the frequency of Falcon 9's monthly launches? While it is a dilemma many companies wish to have, it has to be resolved at some point. The FAA is swamped. Not only does SpaceX demand their attention, but soon-to-be contenders like New Glenn and ULA's Vulcan are gearing up to join the race. This means more licensing, more paperwork, more headaches. Now, don't get SpaceX wrong, they are not undermining safety. We absolutely need watchdogs like the FAA and the US Fish and Wildlife Services. 
Without them, the sky is the limit, and not in a good way this time, leading to potential catastrophes. The ideal solution? Strike a balance. Have enough experts at the helm so that launch licenses are issued quickly without compromising the safety of those living nearby. There is light at the end of the tunnel, though. On October 18th, the US government held a hearing focused on safety, innovation and competitiveness in commercial space ventures. Some big players attended this hearing, mainly Virgin Galactic, Blue Origin and, of course, SpaceX. They are set to help streamline the authorization processes. The FAA has been waving the white flag, asking for reinforcements for years. No dice, but with these giants testifying, the odds might finally be in their favor. SpaceX also has a potential ace up their sleeves, Starship's pivotal role in NASA's Artemis program. Every hiccup, every delay sets humanity's lunar return back weeks, if not more. This adds up. Here is to hoping there is a shift in the winds, making launch licensing a swift process once and for all. Stay tuned. Back at the launch site, we've noticed subtle signs, which, while appearing mundane to the casual observer, have me and you, veteran tank enthusiasts, sitting at the edge of their seats. Several weeks back, SpaceX erected a wall close to the suborbital tank farm. Although our initial thoughts were that it was merely to protect a nearby parking area, our most recent aerial shots, thanks to Redline helicopter tours, have stirred up some concerns. The barrier at the perimeter of the launch site is receiving additional rebar. Word on the ground is that the entire launch site front may soon sport a wall stretching up to 8 meters or around 26 feet high. To paint you a picture, think of the Starhopper. Standing tall at approximately 20 meters or 95 feet, this wall would obscure almost half of it. While there is no official statement on this matter, the speculation is that SpaceX aims to ensure everything outside their launch area remains unaffected during liftoffs and static fires. They don't need another lawsuit in case we see a concrete tornado once again. Contrary to some whispers, this likely isn't a move against us, the Starship fans archiving Starbase's happenings. We're holding our hope that this wall doesn't extend to the launch site's opposite end. If luck is on our side, our photographer John will still have a clear vantage point. But even if we're faced with towering walls, our aerial views will remain uncompromised, all thanks to Redline Helicopter Services. Want to book your own ride at Starbase and see these things in person or just enjoy one of the coolest views in the world? You'll find the link below, I highly recommend it. Shifting our gaze to the construction site, we focus on the high bay. Currently it is a hive of activity with SpaceX actively working on three prototypes. Lined up we have Ship 32 followed by Ship 31 and finally Ship 30. The latter is making steady progress, recently fitted with both its aft flaps and nearing completion of its heat tile installation. While once an exciting sight, these hexagonal black tiles of the Starship heat shield have become a familiar feature visible on nearly every prototype. However, we often forget that this heat shield could revolutionize the aerospace industry. Do you know why? When we think of tile-based heat shields, the mind immediately travels to the iconic Space Shuttle Orbiter. That technological marvel had a staggering 27,000 tiles protecting its aluminum body. Crafted from silica fibers, these tiles boasted impressive heat resistance, but their downside was that they were really fragile, which became a big issue later. Over 24,000 of its 27,000 tiles were distinct, designed for specific spots on the spacecraft. A single crack meant that that very tile had to be painstakingly removed and replaced with another that was specifically made just for that one single spot. Makes you see why shuttle refurbishment was so long and costly. Adding to this complexity, instead of using straightforward clips or bolts, the tiles were attached using a specialized cement. Can you guess how long that cement took to set? Take a wild guess in the comments. The answer? An astonishing 16 hours. Here is a fun fact. Back in the late 70s, a worker dedicated an entire work week to install just one tile. With damage ranging from 30 to 100 broken tiles on every flight, no wonder it took every orbiter a few months to be fully refurbished. Now how is this going to change in the Starship era? Same thing? Same hassle? 
Simplifying the process greatly, Starship adopts universal hexagonal tiles for most of its structure. The brilliance here is double, no need for adding a serial number to every specific tile and the potential for mass production. Granted, areas near the flaps and nose cones still need specialized tiles, but that's just a fraction of what the space shuttle required. Furthermore, Starship takes a more practical approach. Most tiles are secured with clips directly welded onto its body, no more cement and waiting hours for it to cure. This change has drastically optimized the installation process. We're not talking about hours per tile, but tiles per hour, it makes a huge difference. As seen in many videos, it takes mere seconds to install each tile, and in the future, imagine a full-blown factory with robotic arms applying the tiles. But wait, those sizable gaps between the tiles must have caught your eye, a potential hazard, right? You're on the money with that thought. Elon Musk revealed that these ceramic tiles expand under heat. During the fiery re-entry, they'll swell, merging seamlessly, crafting a singular massive heat shield. Without these gaps, they would break under expansion. And what if a tile is missing? After all, that's what caused the Columbia disaster, and we saw some of them flying away during the launch. No need to worry, SpaceX has a backup plan. Beneath these tiles lies a white ceramic heat-resistant mat. That should shield the Starship even if tiles go missing. Additionally, keep in mind that Starship is made from stainless steel. This metal has a melting threshold at 1450 Celsius or 2642 Fahrenheit. Even the aluminum shuttle could survive some tile loss, depending on the phase of the flight. While a naked Starship would have zero chance of surviving the re-entry, the mixture of these three things will hopefully make it reliable. But the burning question remains, how many tiles can the Starship lose and still be able to ace the re-entry? Perhaps the second orbital flight will tell us. Personally, I'd expect fireworks. The first few prototypes will likely meet a fiery end before the heat shield is perfected. But once dialed in, we're talking game-changing reusability plus easy and quick maintenance. What do you think? Is SpaceX tiling the future or should we shift to more experimental solutions like an actively cooled heat shield? Drop your thoughts in the comments, I read as many as I can. And then there is that one towering question remaining. When will the second Starship launch? Let's sum it up. We do have a new notice to Mariners for November 1st, but we also know that talks with the FAA will likely last into early to mid-November. Once these talks are over and once the Fish and Wildlife Services gives a green light, SpaceX should be good to go for that second launch. At the earliest, I'd say we're looking at a mid to late November launch right now. Link2 is giving you the opportunity to invest in the future of human spaceflight. Axiom Space, the only company that will be building a private space station in collaboration with NASA and creating the lunar EVA suits for the Artemis program, is now available to invest in on the Link2 platform. Something I love about this platform is that it is made for investors like me and you who want to invest in our bright future. It is not just for the millionaires of this world. Private equity used to be restricted to just the ultra-wealthy, but Link2 has changed the game, removing barriers for investors. All you have to do is sign up to get started. Now, we are not financial advisors, but what gives me peace of mind is that Link2 always invests in the companies first and only offers companies that they can fully stand behind. In our opinion, Link2 has skin in the game. Consider starting your private equity portfolio today and why viewers get a special $500 discount. Scan the QR code on your screen or go to link2.com slash why to secure your $500 discount off your first investment into any one of the leading space tech companies on Link2. Link2, private investing made simple. Now here's a little task for you. YouTube might have unsubscribed you without your knowledge. Not kidding, they seem to do this frequently. Very important task, double check that subscribe button so that you don't miss our updates. And while you're checking, hit that like button and consider becoming a Y supporter for exclusive SpaceX updates. Everyone gets the same perks regardless of your contribution. You get access to daily Starbase photo galleries, now including aerial and ground photos of SpaceX's progress and countless other extras on top. The next flyover will likely happen on the day you watch this episode. The link to our Patreon page is in the description. Thanks to all the supporters who help fulfill dreams for our team. We can't thank you enough. You rock. Now on to some more fresh news. Did you know that Starliner has been delayed again? 
almost a decade after NASA chose Boeing for the commercial crew program and three years after SpaceX's iconic Demo 2 launch, Starliner is yet to take astronauts to the International Space Station. But winds of change are in the air. The CCP or Commercial Crew Program's core essence was to regain America's option to ferry astronauts to the ISS, a capability that faded with the Space Shuttle's retirement on July 21, 2011. Back then, the space community placed their bets on Boeing's legacy, often side-eyeing SpaceX as the slow one. Yet time played its cards. Dragon might have been a few years late, but since its inaugural launch, it already carried seven crew missions to the ISS, even taking over Boeing's missions. The Starliner's journey, on the other hand, has seen a lot of turbulence. Its debut orbital test ended in an abort when it turned out that a bug in the mission countdown timer prevented the capsule from entering the correct orbit. Ironically, this misstep might have saved the day, as lurking in the shadow was another bug. This one would have set the capsule on a collision course with the ISS during docking. Boeing learned its lesson and come May 2022, Starliner finally docked with the ISS during its second orbital flight attempt. But space has its own way of teaching. Post-return examinations revealed that soft links in the parachute system were too weak. This meant that the whole thing could rip apart during landing. I hope I don't need to explain why having no parachutes isn't the best option when returning to Earth in a capsule. Alarmingly, it was also discovered that the electrical tape surrounding the spacecraft's electronic systems was flammable. Nonetheless, the company is working hard to finally launch the Crewed Flight Test or CFT, Boeing's answer to SpaceX's Demo 2. So when is it? When can we finally expect a crewed launch of this capsule? The latest statements from Boeing suggest that Starliner's moment in the spotlight was scheduled for March 2024. Was, as fate and updated flight schedules would have it, the capsule's journey has been nudged a bit further into April. This is most likely related to SpaceX's flight schedule, as right now they have the priority on crewed missions. SpaceX's Crew 8 is eyeing the stars for a February 2024 launch, followed by Crew 9 making its ascent in August 2024. So it seems Starliner's crewed flight test has found its sweet spot right in the middle of these dates. There is one more question remaining after that. When will Starliner conduct its first regular operational flight? All evidence points away from 2024, with eyes now on potentially switching out the Crew 10 mission for Starliner 1 in the first quarter of 2025. That is over four years after the Crew 1 launch. Here is hoping this time is the term and NASA has an alternate ride on standby. It's amusing and a bit unsettling to think that Starliner's journey to the skies has taken longer than what's left of the ISS's shelf life in orbit. Speaking of aging hardware, the International Space Station isn't quite the revolutionary young thing it used to be. On the evening of October 9th, the ISS had yet another leak, and surprise, surprise, the issue was traced back to the Russian side of the station. Alarm systems sounded when the backup radiator of the Nauka science module started losing its coolant. At this point, you're probably wondering why would a space station need a coolant, especially in the cold void of space? Without thermal controls, the space station's sun-facing side would heat to 250 degrees Fahrenheit or 121 degrees Celsius, while thermometers on the dark side would plunge to minus 250 degrees Fahrenheit or minus 157 Celsius. The ISS addresses this extreme heating and cooling effect with special mylar insulation, which keeps solar radiation out and keeps the bitter cold of space from penetrating the station's metal skin. So that is covered, but there are other heat sources to deal with, and that is where the internal AC is needed. The explanation is simple, just as on our blue planet, orbital stations aren't absent of warmth. Heat sources can be as evident as onboard laptops to more subtle emitters like us, humans. Just living and breathing generates heat even in the vast expanse of space, and you can't just open a window for obvious reasons. Managing that heat is a complex challenge. Unlike the fan-cooled processor in your computer where heat gets distributed through the heat sink and is moved by air due to convection, space offers no such luxury. No air, remember? 
That is why you'll find the International Space Station is employing heat radiation methods. Here's the scoop. The ISS has cooling loops filled with ammonia, a crucial agent for transferring heat via convection from the station's interior to external radiators. These radiators then emit this heat as infrared radiation, an electromagnetic wave akin to visible light or radio signals effortlessly traversing the vacuum of space until something absorbs it. Now imagine the dangers of a coolant leak. Without ammonia, the heat wouldn't make its way into the radiators and the ISS would start overheating. In such an event, the station would have to be quickly evacuated. Although the leak was quickly spotted, it sparked an important question. Why has specifically Russian equipment been problematic again? That is the third coolant leak in less than a year. Something isn't right there. Initially, back in December 2022, we witnessed the Soyuz MS-22's coolant mishap. It got so bad that it required an urgent capsule launch for the crew's safe return to Earth. Not long after, the Progress MS-21 capsule sprung a leak. And now a similar coolant issue emerges from another module. The prior incidents were attributed to micrometeorite impacts, but with repetition across so many different vehicles, eyebrows are inevitably raised. Could it just be an unfortunate run of bad luck? As of now, NASA and Roscosmos are investigating this latest anomaly. Due to safety concerns, a routine spacewalk from the American side is delayed until the issue is resolved. While the presence of ammonia shouldn't pose a danger to astronauts themselves, its potential harm to ISS equipment would necessitate extensive decontamination after the EVA. The lingering question now is, will a Russian EVA be needed to solve this issue? Only time will tell, stay tuned. That's it for today, remember to smash the like button, subscribe for more awesome content, this is what fuels the algorithm and helps us immensely. Check out our epic shirts in your favorite space nerd store, a link is in the description. And if you want to train your space IQ even further, watch this video next to continue your journey. Thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again in the next episode. Although the leak was quickly spotted, it is sparked, it is sparked, it is sparked that an impressed stack, your DJ Aiken in the house. Precisely when you're turning in, turning into it. <laughs> Strike a balance. Authorization. Program. Program.